Now, take a look around here. Do you see any children in here? Do you see any talkative teenagers or anybody, you know, being disruptive in, in my little classroom here? No. This is a very controlled environment. And I know that I am giving you advice on classroom management where some of you have anywhere from 20 to 60 to, if you're a PE teacher, you have 200 kids in your class, okay? So I understand that I'm in this controlled environment giving you advice, but I promise you these strategies when applied and practiced will help you in your classroom, okay? So I just want you to know, I understand that this is, it's very easy to talk about classroom management in this controlled environment. Just wanna lay that on the table right now. Now we're gonna go through some strategies that you can apply in your classroom with those overarching philosophies in mind, okay? So we talked about setting expectations earlier. Now let's talk about how you actually do that. Now we use the term setting expectations rather than school rules or classroom rules. Now they are rules. They are you know expectations in which you want your students to follow. However, we want to frame them in positive language. Now I know some people feel oh, you know just call them what they are school rules. You don't need to church everything up and make everything so positive. Well, actually you do because because framing things in a positive manner actually yield better results, and the research shows that. So I recommend, rather than saying, these are my classroom rules, or this is what you're required to do, instead it's more like, hey, I want the classroom to run smoothly. I know you do too. Let's set some classroom expectations together so that we both get the most out of instruction and out of this class. So that's kind of the way you can frame it with students. Then what I would do is actually bring students in to help you build these expectations. Now you might say, well, it's the middle of the year now. How am I going to do this? You can stop at any time and revise the expectations of the classroom, revisit the expectations of the classroom, and even you know add new expectations to the classroom. So there's never a good or a bad time to do this. Just do it if you need to. Now, when setting classroom expectations, I would recommend to tell the students, hey, you know what, I've been uh, thinking about classroom expectations and I'd like to get your take on this. I think together we should draft three or four major expectations for the classroom that we all follow so that we can all get the most out of what's happening here. As soon as you say that, students are gonna you know, be willing to kind of jump in and give their two cents and then also follow those expectations. Now, we want to frame this conversation so that students can understand, you know, that it is about classroom expectations. It's not like, oh, we should have, you know, chips at noon and uh, watch a movie at, at two before school ends and things like that. That's not setting classroom expectations. What you can do is guide your students into kind of agreeing to a set of expectations that you're setting. So for example, you might say something like, all right guys, we're gonna have four major expectations for the classroom. And I want you to think about it with your shoulder partner. What do you think makes a class run smoothly? What do, you, what do we need in order for us to start on time, to make sure that we get supplies in the right places, to make sure we're interacting in a respectful manner? What do you think are some things that we can commit to in order to make that happen? And sure enough, students are probably gonna say, well, we need to be on time, you know? And you might lead them to that, okay? How, how do we start on time? Does that mean everybody has to be here on time? Yes, everybody should be on time. Do you think that should be an expectation, a, a pretty you know, uh, set in stone expectation? Yes, be on time, that's important. Okay, so you write that down. That's one of your expectations. And again, it's worded in positive language, be on time. Not don't be late, but instead be on time. Um, Another expectation you might say, okay, what, what else do we need for us to kind of interact in a manner where we are learning and not fighting and not being angry at one another? And they say, oh, well, you have to, you know, be respectful or maybe you kind of help them get to that. Yes, be respectful. Not just be respectful to the teacher, but I need to be respectful to you too, right? Yes, yes, we should be respectful. Okay, do you think that should be one of the expectations? Yes, okay, be respectful. And you go down the line and go through this, right? You may even ask them, what do you need from me? What can the teacher do? Well, maybe it's be respectful or be understanding or be kind or something like that. Okay, be kind. Start to narrow this down. You might end up with 
10 expectations. You don't want that many. You only want about four. Narrow them down, narrow them down, and then you and the students have agreed on these expectations. Yes, this is going to take a class period. Yes, this is going to take away from whatever test you're prepping your students for the end of the year. But I guarantee you, if you set these expectations in the beginning, your students are going to be um, better able to meet those expectations. And then if ever somebody is, you know, not working towards those expectations, you can say, hey, so-and-so, Remember our expectations? You helped me draft these. We all agreed on these. Can we make sure we're meeting the second expectation today? And that's to be on time. Yes. Okay. Let's make sure we're doing that. You know, and then if it's a repeat offender, then you have to move on to the more, you know, punitive measures. But that's going to mitigate a lot of those dangling little problems that you have with students who don't understand your expectations. They're clearly stated. They're on the board. Maybe we write them down in our planners. Maybe we put them as a screensaver on our phones. Whatever it is, that's what we're going to want to work on. So I drafted four expectations you might want to use in your classroom, or you can adapt them, or you can, you know, make up your own. But here are four that I think are really good um, expectations that you can kind of move your students toward agreeing to. The first one is be on time. I put that at the top because I taught high school and you can't have stragglers coming in after lunch. Like you got to be here on time. It, it disrupts the class too much. I have ADD. And so any kind of disruption kind of sends me down a rabbit hole where I can't get out of, like I can't get my concentration back. So people coming in late and disrupting is like a no-no in my classroom. So be on time um, is really important for my classroom expectations. The second expectation is engage 100% in the activities or procedures that we're doing that day. I think I should give you 100% as a teacher and you should give me 100% as a student. And so when we come up with that, now I'm accountable for this expectation and my students are also accountable for this expectation. The next thing is be respectful, of course. Now that might be number one on the top of your list. And it is it is very important. I don't think any one of these is more important than the other. I just, you know, being on time and engaging 100% are my like main ones. Maybe be respectful or be kind is at the top of your, your list, whichever one, but be respectful. I'm going to respect you as my student and I would like you to respect me as your instructor, okay? And then the last expectation that I love is be yourself. I'm going to be myself and I want you to be yourself because that's how you're going to learn. I want you to engage with activities and lessons by bringing your background knowledge, by bringing your culture, by bringing your, you know, worldly experiences to the learning. And I'm going to do the same thing for you. I'm going to bring my knowledge, my culture, my information, my life experiences to the learning so that we can maximize instruction. All right. So those are some expectations you can use in your classroom, or you can do a variation of those, but setting those clear expectations and having them be like your credo of your classroom, revisiting them. Hey guys, let's take a look at our expectations. How do you feel like we're doing on these expectations? Are we, have we been on time? Yeah, nobody's been on, nobody's been late for like, I don't know, six months. It's been awesome. Great job, you know, or, well, we kind of need to revisit this expectation. Why, why are we late? What's going on? Maybe there's a lunchroom problem, whatever it is. Okay. And then move on down the line, constantly revisit them. They're just like objectives. You have to communicate them and you have to let your students know that, you know, we're still here. We're still working on this stuff because those are important for a smooth classroom, for a smooth activity, for a smooth whatever. Now, once you've set those expectations and you and your students have discussed them, refined them, and made them like your classroom credo, now we're gonna move into procedures which help you meet those expectations. Procedures, procedures, procedures. Now, I'm gonna use some of my own experiences here to let you know how this has worked for me. When I first started teaching, I came on as a substitute teacher. I had a degree in something else. Some of you know this story. I had a degree in something else and I wasn't sure I wanted to be a teacher. So I came into the high school setting as a substitute teacher. A teacher was retiring and I was um, running with the cross country coach at that time and working with those kids in cross country. And he mentioned, hey, so-and-so is retiring. Why don't you come on and become the uh, teacher? I'll talk to the principal. Well, it was great because I ended up being a substitute teacher in the same class for the whole semester. So I didn't have to go to different classes. And I really got to understand, you know, high school and realize that that's where I wanted to be and that's what I wanted to do. 
But before that, I came in totally green and new, and I was walking into a high school classroom where I didn't know even where to begin. My mother, who was a principal at the time, gave me a book called The First Days of School, and I'll link it up in the um, description below. It's by Harry Wong. It's like a big elementary book. It's, it's you know, uh, landscape. You open it up. I don't have it. Otherwise, I would show you guys it, but you can look it up online, The First Days of School, and it's a very basic how-to for the new teacher. Now, I was skeptical at first because it kind of looks like an elementary school type book. And I was like, I teach high school. You know, I don't teach elementary. But the practices in this book were, you know, invaluable to me. They were just unbelievably important in my success in working with these students. So I read the first days of school, but I kind of was like, eh, whatever, and went in and tried my own thing. You know, these are high school kids. I was a little nervous. You know, I think I was like 27 at the time or whatever. So I go in, I'm the substitute teacher and these kids are pushing boundaries. I mean, they're high school kids. Um, this one class that I had was deemed the bad class and a teacher actually quit that class. She told the principal she couldn't do it anymore to switch them out. And they gave them to me, the new, the new substitute teacher. And I had never met them before. Um, so I was already a little bit freaked out. Like, oh my God, is this class like the bad class? Are they gonna, you know, make my life miserable? So I was, I was really nervous. So I read the first days of school and looked at the procedures and I realized that I needed to really practice these procedures if the kids were going to listen to what I had to say and if they were going to get the most out of their classroom. And so one of the things in this book that was really important is that you have to practice procedures. You can't just say, hey guys, all right, you know what? We do bell ringer when you come in and then when you're done, we go over that and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and that's the class. So I want you to follow those procedures. Well, what's going to happen the next day? The kids are going to come in and they're not going to remember your procedures that you told them. You already just went over these expectations. Now we've got procedures. They're like, whatever. The only way to really get it embedded so that the procedures are followed are to practice the procedures. And I mean over and over and over and over again. So I went into this class. I had seven periods at the time because we were on a seven, seven period schedule. Some of the classes were pretty passive. They didn't care. They came in. They did what I said. But this one class was very challenging. I couldn't get them to follow my procedures. So I went back to the book and I saw, yes, you have to practice them, like literally stop all instruction. We're not doing anything until the procedures are down pat. Now, this was hard because they had already started a whole year. We were at the middle. We were right after Christmas break. That's when I came on. And so now I got to stop in the middle of the year and redo these procedures. And I was so nervous because it's like, these guys are high school kids and I'm going to go, okay, guys, we're going to stop everything we're doing and we're going to practice these procedures over and over and over again. You know, I was afraid they would stab me with their pencils, but I knew something had to happen because we couldn't move on. It was chaos. So I basically told them we're not doing any work today. And they were like, yeah, you know, awesome. And I said, instead, we are going to practice the procedures of this classroom so we can do fun things like labs and group work and all the stuff we all want to do. But we need to get our procedures down so that we're successful at that. Now, they pushed back a little bit. They were like, oh, this is stupid, you know, and they mumbled and grumbled. But ultimately, I am the teacher and I wanted them to do this thing with me. So come hell or high water, we were going to do this. So what we did was I set the procedures for the classroom. The first thing you do is you come in, you sit down, and you do the assignment on the board. This gives you time to, you know, take attendance and things like that. Now I'm going to go over how to use bell work and how to draft bell work in just a second. But you're going to come in, sit down, and do whatever I have on the board. There will be something on the board for you to do. It could be read a section of something. It could be answer a question. It could even be talk to your shoulder partner and come up with something. It could be any of these things, regardless of what it is. Come in, sit down, look at the board. What am I supposed to do today? Not only come in, but come in quietly. Come in respectfully. Come in like you're ready to learn, all right? And then um, the other thing was, let give me the time it takes to do attendance. 
and then we'll start. So that was the only procedure I needed them to do. I needed them to come in quietly and respectfully because up until that time, they had been jumping in on each other. These are huge 18 year old kids, you know, just like punching each other. Like it was crazy when they were coming in. So we had to stop that. And then the next thing is look at the board. This is my expectation for you for the first it could be anywhere from five to 15 minutes, depending on you know how complicated the bell work was, all right? That procedure. So what did we do? We practiced it for the entire period. I said, all right, everybody get up, grab your backpacks, go out into the hall. They were like, this is so lame, this is so stupid, I can't believe she's making us do this. They went out. They came in, they did they did things that were not right, you know, they kind of goofed around, they're pushing me, you know. They came in, sat down, plopped down, and I had something there. I It was just a fake thing, you know, like, okay, this is your bell ringer, blah, blah, blah. And they looked at it, and, and it wasn't that great of a first time run. I said, okay, pretty good, pretty good. That's not exactly what I want. Let's practice it again. Grab your backpacks, get up, go out into the hall. And they were like, oh, my God, this is just, uh, out into the hall. Do it again. They were a little bit better. Some of the kids were like, stop joking around. We want to get through this. Like, just let's, I don't want to keep doing this all day. Do it right. Okay. Came in a little bit better. Sat down. Looked at the bell ringer on the board. Better. I said to them, okay, pretty good. Doing, doing better. I focused on some good things. So-and-so, you actually came in and you, you were respectful, quiet. Thank you so much. All right. Let's do it again. Grab your backpacks. Take it out the door. Come on in. And we did this five or six or seven times. By the seventh time, they were serious. They were out there. They came in, put their backpacks down, looked to the board, saw the bell ringer, sat there quietly and looked at me. And it worked. I couldn't believe it. This book, the first days of school, he said, do it over and over and over again. Stop all instruction. Do not do anything else until your procedures are down. I couldn't believe it. These kids were like 18 year old kids who had, they had no reason to get their book bag and walk out in the hall, come back in, walk out in the hall, come back in, but they did. So the next day after we practiced for the entire period, I went over to my door, stood in the hallway and waited for them to come to my classroom. Now I always like to greet students in the hallway if I can. I know sometimes things get you on your computer and you gotta do things before the next class or whatever, but I always like to stand at my door, say their name. Welcome Jose, I'm so glad you're here today. How you doing? Welcome Julie, how, how are things going? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being on time. Looking forward to the class today. That kind of positive energy to my students. They're coming in, I'm looking at them, the bell ringer's on the board, they're all sitting down, they're taking out their pencils. I'm like kind of excited by the door, but trying not to show it because I don't wanna show them that I'm excited. And one by one they came in, they were on time, they sat down and they did it. Now that was the first day after we practiced the procedures. A couple days later, they, they might have fallen off a little bit. What did we do? Let's grab our backpacks, guys. Let's go back out into the hall. Anytime. It got chaotic any time where they weren't doing it. We practiced it again and it worked. They became such uh, respectful students, ready to learn, ready for their assignments. And in turn, I was ready. I prepared very rigorous and relevant lessons for them because I didn't have to deal with this beginning 10 minutes of chaos that takes my peace away, that takes my you know desire to teach away. Once I fixed that crazy situation of the students coming in like lunatics, now everything is kind of easy. Now I have all this energy to give to them. And in turn, they have that same energy to give to me. Now that is a high school example, but you can use that obviously in any grade level. Practice, practice, practice. So if you're starting the school year, you don't wanna do anything except procedures in the first, like they, they say the first week, I say the first couple of days. I think you can get your procedures down the first couple of days. Nothing but procedures. Okay, if it's high school, I would say the first couple of classes, nothing but procedures and practice, not just say these are the procedures. Get up, grab your backpacks, go outside, come down, look at the board, let's do it again, again and again. Very, very important. Now, if it's in the middle of the year and you wanna set expectations now and you wanna set these procedures now, do it now. Just stop what you're doing, take a couple of days or a couple of class periods and practice, 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 practice. Your principal is not gonna be upset that you stopped instruction in order to refine your procedures in your classroom management. 
So procedures, 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 practiced procedures are very, very important. So keep that in mind when applying these strategies in the classroom.